today we have got um, Ben Fielding, who is uh, going to give us a talk on the Romanovs, which I think in terms of timing is absolutely excellent, given it's about a 100-year anniversary, isn't it? Um, uh, ben has had an interest in all things Eastern European from a very young age, and actually did Russian studies at university. Uh, so, we're in very good hands, so could you please welcome Ben in the usual way. Right, okay, so, uh, as Chris said, it's very apposite to be dealing with this topic now, as in a few months' time we will be hitting the centenary of the murder of the Imperial family in Yekaterinburg. Um, I did wonder how I was going to get this topic done in an hour because it is a very complex topic. Um, until I wondered, until that is, I read Simon Sebag Montefiore's recent book on the Romanovs and uh, just the first couple of paragraphs of his introduction, the first thing he mentioned was that the dynasty itself is bookended by two teenage boys because the first Romanov to rule was a 16-year-old boy who actually turned down the throne three times, which I'll go into in more detail in a moment. And, of course the heir to the throne at the time of the assassination in Yekaterinburg in July 1918 was himself only 13. That being the haemophilia uh, Cesarevich Alexei. Okay. Is this working? No, it is not. Power on. I can't find the power switch. Aha, right. <laughs> okay, let's get going then. Wakey, wakey. Ah, we have it. Okay. So, th there's the founder of the dynasty. There is Mikhail Fyodorovich Romanov, born 1596, died 1645, and became, uh, or was elected to be Tsar of Russia in 1613 at the end of the period of history, the interregnum, known as the Time of Troubles. So, founder of the dynasty, as I said, 16 years old when elected and reigned for some 30 years. And here's the other teenager that, we, that I just mentioned. Alexei Nikolaevich, the, the only son of uh, Tsar Nicholas II and of uh, Tsarina Alexandra Fyodorovna, born 1904 and murdered along with the rest of the family in 1918. So I'm going to split my discussion of the Romanov family into uh, two distinct parts. One will be the male line, which lasts from 1613 up until 1762. And then the, fem the female line, the czars that descended down the female bloodline, who go up from 1762 to 1918. So, and in both cases, I'll deal with a little bit of the historical context and the origins and how they came to be in charge and then the end of the line, as it were. So rulers in this first part, Mikhail Fyodorovich, who we've just met a couple of slides ago, Reigned 1613 to 1645, founder of the dynasty. His son, Alexei Mikhailovich, 
1645 to 76. Uh, then Lexi's first son of three to reign. Uh, he died in his own teenage years. Fyodor the third. And then you've got two co-rulers from 1682. You've got Ivan V, who is Alexei's son from his first marriage, and therefore the full-blood brother of Fyodor III. And you've got Peter the Great, as he later becomes known, who is Alexei's son from his second marriage to Natalia Nerishkina. Catherine I, Peter the Great's second wife. Peter II, his only grandson. As you can see, there's a very um, rapid turnover. Anna Ivanov, the daughter of Ivan V. Ivan VI, her grandnephew, who was a babe in arms when he came to the throne and we'll find out a bit more about him afterwards. There's Yeta Petrovna, daughter of Peter the Great and Romanovs. So, let's put a bit of meat on the historical bones here. So, I mentioned before a period of interregnum uh, after which Mikhail was enthroned. So, Smutnoya Vremia, the time of troubles. Um, this is a period of Russian history that I myself have been interested in for a long time. It's a very, relatively short period, but this is the period at the end of which the Romanovs first came to power. Okay, so very famous Russian artwork here. Um, some of you may, reckon, may know of it, some of you may not. Ivan the Terrible murders his son Ivan. Ilya Repin painted 1885. And this depicts the historical event which led to the succession problems after 1598. Basically, what had happened was Ivan the Terrible had had a rather violent argument with his son, as fathers and sons sometimes do, and he'd ended up striking him with the staff you see in the foreground there, and the blow was fatal. So, the event the murder in 1581 contributes to the succession as I've just said after 1598 okay so this was Ivan the Terrible's eventual successor the Tsar Fyodor the first um, ruled from 1584 to 98 had no children of his own and that's what led to the um, interregnum and the succession crisis, essentially. The handicapped second son of Ivan the Terrible, which obviously uh, let, gave rise to its own problems, and of Anastasia Zakharina Yurieva, who will become important again when we visit Mikhail in a moment, and his childlessness led to the succession failure that precipitated the time of troubles. Um, so you've also got there a depiction of Tsarevich Dmitri, who was Ivan the Terrible's son from his last marriage and his fate has been a matter of debate for all Russian historians because nobody knew what 
well, let's just say he died in very suspicious circumstances. And um, the fact that nobody knew really what had happened to him led to a situation like you had in England at the time of Henry the Seventh, where the various pretenders to the throne came to the fore. So, <coughs> okay. So this is now Boris Godunov, the brother-in-law of uh, Fyodor, who we saw a couple of slides ago. Um, it's a very famous opera about him by... I forget who it is at the second, but as I say, Fyodor's brother-in-law, who had a brilliant, had a very important role in the court of the Tsar, and because the Tsar had no ch no surviving children, managed to get himself elected as the next ruler. Fifteen ninety-eight, brother-in-law and chief minister elected to the Tsardom by the Assembly of the Land, hero of the play by Pushkin, Boris Godunov, and of Mussorgsky's opera, Modest Mussorgsky, which was based upon the play. Excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you, but oh. I wonder if you could stand to the side, because I, I can't see the pictures or the writing when you come close to it. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's better, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, now this is the, f I mentioned a second ago that there were some pretenders to the throne who um, pretended to be the disappeared Tsarevich Ivan. This is the first, uh, Tsarevich Dmitri rather, the f and this is the first of them. He was actually a defrocked monk from Poland of all places uh, Poland being a very important power in Eastern Europe at the time uh, and he was the first uh, false Dmitri who who after Boris Godunov died managed to occupy the throne for a very brief period and the painting by a fellow Pole, Shimon Bogushevich, and also someone who is quite contemporary, whereas, you, whereas before you notice a lot of the paintings were done several centuries later. Okay, so Vasily Shwiski, important um, member of the noble class as it were, the Boyer class. Um, he managed to get himself elected in 1606 in opposition to the false Dmitri, although he'd originally um, been a supporter of Dmitri. Okay? And he turned against the imposter, was elected his successor, and banished to a monastery following dethronement in 1610. So in other words, in the five years that um, that Boris Godunov had been dead, you'd had th three different people who had occupied the throne. So, obvious instability. Right. Uh, King Sigmund III of Poland, who became an important player, from outside. So, following Schwiski's deposition, Sigmund took advantage of Russia's perceived weakness and claimed the throne against the nobles' wish to elect his son Władysław. Uh, his troops invaded Russia and occupied the country for two years. Um, there's a very recent Russian film about this called 1612 which is to do with the eventual overthrow 
of the um, Polish occupiers. Come on, right. So, Kuzmiminin and Dmitry Pajarski, these were the guys who led the uh, campaign against the Poles. And they basically led a peasant army to overthrow the occupiers in 1612, which is the story that's told in the film I just mentioned. Um, <coughs> so respectively, a minor prince from Suzdal, which is about 100 miles from Moscow, and a um, meat merchant from Nizhny Novgorod, up in the north. Um, and as has been true at several periods in Russian history, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church was a very important rallying point for um, the opposition to the Poles. And he, he died in Polish custody in 1612 and canonized just before the end of the Romanov era. So around about 400, no, 300 years after he died. And he's depicted there on the Millennium Monument in the city of Novgorod, which was erected not to mark mille the millennium in 2000, but the millennium of the Russian Orthodox Church in the 1980s. So a quick family tree view of the beginning Romanovs up to Peter the second there. So you, you can see the fact that Alexei Mikhailovich, who I mentioned earlier on, married twice. And as you can imagine, this created a lot of friction at the court because you had one side who were allied with the family of his first wife and one side allied with the family of his second wife. So, okay, key location in the Romanov story. The Apatievsky Monastery in Kostroma. This was where the teenage Mikhail was cloistered up during the time of troubles. And this is where he was approached three times and turned down the throne three times before eventually he accepted the position. This is just to give you an idea of where Kostroma is. So Moscow is there. Yaroslavl and Kostroma is just here, okay? So that's just to give you an idea of how far from Moscow he was. So we finally come to Mikhail. First point about him. The great nephew of Ivan Grozny, that's Ivan the Terrible, and Anastasia Romanovna. Now, we spoke, or I mentioned them a moment ago, and Anastasia, Ivan the Terrible's first and favorite wife. Elected Tsar by the Semsky Sobor, the Assembly of the Land in 1613 as I've already alluded to. Now, he inherited a country that was at war with both Finland, uh, sorry, with both Sweden and Poland. So, he, his first task as ruler was really to end those wars. And he ruled in effective diarchy with the patriarch Philaret, who was his father, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church until 1633. 
and we're about to meet Filaret on the next slide. Fyodor Nikitich Romanov, as his original name was, before he got thrown into a monastery and became a monk. Okay, adopted the name of Romanov in tribute to his grandfather. So, his grandfather was the father of Anastasia, who'd been married to Ivan the Terrible. Uh, this was Roman Fyodorovich. Um, so, so he takes the patronymic surname of Romanov in tribute to his grandfather, who was the, progenit who was the father of the Empress Consort, effectively. A distinguished soldier and diplomat made a boyar in 1583. That basically means he joined the nobility. Because entry to the boyar class, which is what we would understand as the nobility, was controlled by the Tsar. It was completely in the Tsar's gift. So Ivan the Terrible promoted him. Confined to a monastery by Boris Godunov, who we met a few slides back, uh, took the, mono the um, monkish name Filaret, Freed by the false Dmitri, again the pretender, made Metropolitan of Rostov. Metropolitan is the equivalent of our Archbishop, so Archbishop of Rostov, and later elevated to the Patriarchate of Moscow and all Russia, which was created in 1598. Imprisoned by the invading Poles in 1610, and only released after the peace of Dulina had ended the war with Poland. So, from Mikhail, we move on to his son, Alexei Mikhailovich. Okay. So, um, although Mikhail had managed to sort of stabilize his position, there, were, there was still a lot of opposition to the Romanov rule, and several of these rebellions uh, broke out during the reign of his son. So he reconquered many of the traditional Russian lands from Poland. So all the, the areas that Poland had conquered during the time excuse me, just before and during the time of Troubles. I mean, we're talking about areas that are today in Belarus and Ukraine. Brought in foreign experts to help run the army, reform the administration, and to help build and run industries. Not the first one probably to do that, but certainly not the last. And he completed the legal process, which had begun way back under Fyodor I, which tied the peasants to the land. So this is full serfdom coming in, which, as we'll find out later on, would last for the next couple of hundred years. So what happens after the death of first Alexei and then his son Fyodor is that um, he leaves behind two sons who are too young to rule. And his daughter becomes effective regent and power behind the throne. So Ivan V and Peter I, Ivan is about 14 at the time of their coming to the throne, and Peter's about 10. And Ivan, to add, to add problems to the mix, is also, well, I suppose you'd say simple-minded, I suppose. He's... He's got mental health problems, quite serious ones. 
So Sophia becomes the power behind the throne. But what you've got happening throughout Sophia's regency is effectively an inter-family rivalry between the family of Ivan's uh, mother and the family of Peter's mother, the Miroslavskys and the Narishkins. And this rivalry, as so many do in Russian history, turns very violent and very bloody. I mean, we are talking about a blood-soaked dynasty here in many ways. And it all comes to a head at around the time that Ivan dies in the late 1690s, when there's a massive rebellion of the palace guards, and they basically start throwing people off balconies and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's like the defenestration of Prague, but I suppose even worse. And most of the victims are actually members of the Narishkin family, so Peter's relatives. But what happens when Ivan eventually dies is that Peter feels himself in a strong enough position to sideline Sophia and throw her in a monastery. You know, get thee to a nunnery and all this sort of thing, dear sister. And um, there's a massive rebellion not long after Peter comes to the throne of the Streltsy, which is the uh, the elite Imperial Guard Regiment, and Peter crushes this rebellion, and suspecting Sophia to be behind it, he arrests all the perpetrators and hangs them outside her window, which is nice. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the, the, you can't imagine a more a more um, blatant message than that, if that's the right uh, word to use. Okay, so just a, a reminder of the family tree. This one's going a bit further this time. So starting with Mikhail, whether as the previous one started with Ivan the Terrible, and it's only dealing with Peter the Great and afterwards, rather than the other line. So you've got um, Peter the First marrying Ekaterina, his second wife, and this gives you an idea of where we go up to 19, up to 1801, including Catherine the Great, as you see there. So, Pyotr Vieliki, as he's known in Russian, Peter the Great, as we call him. So, he, bega he begins the process of opening Russia up to the West. Just after he comes to the throne, he famously leaves the country, becoming the first Russian ruler ever to do so, and tours Europe, learning how to do things like boat building, and... Um, he's learning about armaments and various things because his main policy goal is to get, is to op well, to open a brush to the west, but also to get a coastline on the Baltic. And he realizes that in order to do this, he's going to need a navy to defend it. So he goes undercover, turns up in the shipyards in Holland. Uh, pretending to be a, carpent, a humble carpenter, and he watches the master shipwrights to learn how... He learns for himself how to build boats and then takes the knowledge back with him. I mean, he, he did also come to England. Uh, he, famous, he and a group of his mates famously stayed with the diarist John Evelyn, 
and made rather a mess in John Evelyn's house with all their uh, hijinks, as it were. <clears throat> so finally secured permanent access to the Baltic, as I've just mentioned, and of course established the city of St. Petersburg, which will come up in a minute. He annexed Kamchatka and the Kuril Islands in the Far East, commissioned Vitus Bering to discover whether there was a land bridge between Russia and North America. This is where the Bering Strait gets its name. Uh, Vitus Bering being a Danish cartographer. Founds the city of St. Petersburg upon the Gulf of Finland and moves his capital there in 1703. Institutes compulsory education for the aristocracy. So, again, massive reforms. Abolished the Streltsy, the Guards Regiment that I mentioned just now. And he reformed the Standing Army. Builds the First Navy, drafting in Dutch experts to help him do so. And these are not the only military experts that he gets from abroad. A lot of um, generals and so on. A lot of other, a lot of seasoned soldiers are brought in to help run the army. Forces the nobility to leave their estates to a single heir, going against the tradition of splitting it all up between the various sons, which had caused many many succession issues, even at the highest um, strata of Russian society over the decades and centuries, and overhauls the state bureaucracy to make it more efficient. Sounds quite communist, I hear you cry. So, okay, the end of the male line. So, as far as the succession is concerned, Peter the Great decrees in the 1720s that in future the emperor, which is a title he himself has adopted in 1721, he decrees that the emperor from this day forward will nominate his own successor. Now, Peter the Great dies in 1725 at the end of the Great Northern War and apparent, apparently he dies after diving into the Gulf of Finland to pull out a man who was drowning. And he, caught, he obviously caught a chill of some sort and with his dying breath he apparently called over someone to his bedside and said, leave it all to, and then died. <laughs> so, although he said the emperor nominates his own successor, he didn't manage to do such. So, then the military interferes and brings to power initially his widow, Elizabeth, uh, sorry, Catherine the First, as you see there, um, his peasant bride, as you might call her. She was born in Tallinn, I believe, as a very well to a very minor, minor noble family. She wasn't of royal blood of any way, shape, or form. Um, so she only lasts a couple of years. Then her grandson, Peter II, comes to the throne. But he only lasts a few years, dies of typhus in 1730. And then you've got the interbranch rivalry in the family again, because you've got the descendants of Ivan V, and the descendants of Peter the Great vying for power. 
So Anna Ivanovna is brought to the throne first of all. Uh, she, she lasts about 10 years. But when she dies in 1740, she leaves the throne to Peter the Great. Uh, sorry, to her grand nephew, who is Ivan V's only grandson. And there he is, the little Ivan VI, two months old when he's brought to the throne. And the man who acts as regent is Anna Ivanovna's former lover, Bir Count Biren. And there's, his mo there's Peter, uh, sorry, Ivan's mother on the right, uh, Anna Leopoldovna of Mecklenburg Schwerin. So, as you imagine, this state of affairs does not last too long. Because what happens is that Elizaveta Petrovna, Peter the Great's daughter, comes along, orchestrates a palace coup with the help of the guards' regiments, surprise, surprise, and throws him and her into prison for the rest of their lives. And here she is, Elizaveta Petrovna. I've forgotten to put the uh, animation on, obviously. So, gains power in the palace coup, as I've just said. Appoints Peter of Holstein Gottorp, her nephew, as her heir, because she never had any children. Arranged his marriage to Sophia van Halt Zerbst, who becomes very important later on. She intervenes in the War of the Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War amongst other things. Uh, she, she also is a... Russia's also at war with Sweden for a period during her reign and authorised Lomonosov to reorganise the Academy of Sciences which creates Moscow State University, effectively. Moscow State University is the Oxford of Russia. So... Elizaveta Petrovna, and we reach the end of the line. Any questions before I go on? Any questions? Yes, go. No, oh, Catherine the Great is coming up. She's coming up. Okay. So, again, I'll do the same thing. I mean, I've gone through the historical context and the rise to power with this one now so we're on to the female line so rulers in this line Peter the third six months in 1762 overthrown by his wife with the help of the military again here's Catherine the Great Paul Petrovich their son Alexander the first the man who vanquishes Napoleon Nicholas I, who loses the Crimean War. Alexander II, who frees the serfs. Alexander III. Nicholas II, we know all about him. The, the, Nicholas the Last. Okay, so the Germans are coming. Why do I say the Germans are coming? Because these are both German. Okay? So, Peter III is the... He's born as Karl Peter Ulrich of Holstein Gottorp, and he is the nephew of the childless Empress Elizabeth Petrovna. She organizes his marriage to Sophia of Anhalt Zerbst, as we saw a couple of slides ago. And when P Peter, who's a bit of a martinet and a terribly ineffective ruler, obsessed with military drills, is overthrown after six months on the throne. Catherine is the one who's brought to the throne and she's obviously the one who will be known to later ages as Catherine the Great. Uh, this is just to show the area where these guys came from 
up around the bolt, up around Kiel, was where Peter Peter the Third was born. So right top left up there, near near today's German Danish border. And this is the little here's the Principality of Zerbst where Catherine the Great was born. This orange bit here. So you've got Magdeburg right at the top of the map there to give you a bit of context. City of Dessau down there. Uh, trying to look for places you uh, the people will have heard of. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of where they were from. So the great Catherine. So she's the She's the one who brings enlightenment ideas to Russia. She is one of the great enlightened despots of the later 18th century. Along with Fred yeah, Frederick the Great and Joseph II of Austria. Okay, so she brings in enlightenment ideals. She is a correspondent of people like Voltaire and Rousseau and so on. Um, she, she does eventually turn against the Enlightenment, as many people did after the French Revolution. Uh, she faces down several pretenders, the most threatening of whom was Yevgeny Pugachev, who um, led a massive rebellion among the Ukrainian Cossacks. Um, and he he pretended that he was Peter the Third. He claimed that Peter the Third had not been killed, and that he was the rightful ruler. Instituted many reforms in education, public health, and justice. So again, we're going back into the Enlightenment ideals here. And she found several educational institutions and personally supervises the, elder, the education of her two eldest grandsons, so the future Alexander I and his brother Constantine. She reorganized and streamlined the central government and modernized the military. So she's doing several of the things that Peter the Great did a century before. And indeed, if... Any of you who've been to St. Petersburg here and will have seen the statue of the Bronze Horseman, uh, that equestrian statue of Peter the Great, she's the one that actually puts it up. <coughs> Renounced Peter III's claims in Germany and Denmark. So we, we've already established that Peter III was the prince of a small um, territory or close to what's today Germany's border with Denmark. And one of the things that the Peter, one of the few things that Peter the Great did after coming, uh, sorry, one of the first things that Peter the Third did after coming to the throne was to pull Russia out of the Seven Years' War, just as. Frederick the Great was about to lose because being a Prussian, being a proud Prussian, Peter idolized Frederick the Great. And so he, pull, he pulls out um, Russian forces from the Seven Years' War, saves Frederick the Great's bacon, Danish bacon, presumably. <laughs> and, and, sorry. <laughs> and... Um, his main foreign policy in his six months in power is to try and hold on to his territories in Germany. So she takes part in the Polish partitions with Austria and Prussia. Now this is one of the darker th episodes that Catherine is involved in. Uh, so the three so-called enlightened despots in Austria, Prussia, and Moscow, take advantage of the failing Polish state in the 1770s to the 1790s, and 
basically carve it up over a period of time between themselves. So that comes 1795, Poland disappears from the map until after World War I. And most of the territory goes to Russia. <coughs> and she continues the war with Turkey in, in pursuit of access to the Black Sea. And the key point in that period is the conquest of Crimea in 1780. So we're on to the last branch of the family now. So you've got Pavel Petrovich up there, the son of Peter III and Catherine the Great, who is kept off the throne in 1762 by Catherine's usurpation, and who is basically kept off the throne until his mother dies. Um, of course, this leads to, well, it's mild to put it as a strained relationship with his mother. He absolutely loathed her, to be quite honest. And um, the first thing he did when he came to power in 1801 was to undo most of her reforms. But um, the one important thing that he does as well, in terms of the succession, he actually abolishes... Peter the Great's um, pronouncement that the emperor will nominate his own successor and puts in place a, a patrilineal succession law, which is one of the most restrictive in Europe at the time. Okay, so this takes us up to... So, Pavel Petrovich, I've just mentioned that. Uh, he reversed most of Catherine's reforms. The only one he kept and indeed tightened was censorship of the press and of literature. Okay? He established male primogeniture, which is what I've just referred to with the succession law. Created the first government ministries, including the infamous third section, which was the secret police joined the second coalition against revolutionary France. So, and dethroned and murdered. N nice running theme here. Uh, murdered in a coup d'etat led by Count Parlin, who was one of the top military governors in the country. Okay, so he only lasted five years overthrown, thrown into the Peter and Paul fortress, and then supposedly suffocated. Alexander the First, Alexander the Blessed, I, refer, I referred to the fact that earlier on that he led the Russian forces against Napoleon. Okay. So brought up by Catherine the Great, he was the elder of the two grandsons that she brought up. To be enlightened despots, allowed landlords to free their serfs if they wished. Mm hmm. Ahem. Created schools in every village. So, again, enlightenment ideals coming through to um, educate the peasantry. Began the annexation of Transcaucasia, so the provinces on the south of the Caucasus Mountains, which took the next 50 years. Conquered Finland from Sweden in 1809. Foreign policy dominated by the Napoleonic Wars, as I've already said. Led Russian troops into the Battle of the Nations, the Battle of Leipzig in 1813. And that was the decisive battle where the wars turned against Napoleon and the combined forces of Prussia, Russia, Sweden, and so on, Britain, effectively beat Napoleon back across Europe and came to occupy Paris in 1814. 
and have a high old time doing so. And the first king of the Congress Kingdom of Poland. Okay, the explanation as to what happened there. Um, the Congress of Vienna in 1814 obviously decided where all the political borders in Europe were going to be after the Napoleonic Wars. And the Russian portions of Poland then remain, I mean, they'd been a kingdom anyway, with, but they officially became a kingdom with the Tsar of Russia as the king. Okay, so, and it was nicknamed the Congress Kingdom because it was created by the Congress of Vienna. So, Alexander's brother, Nicholas I, comes to power in December 1825. And the, the first thing he's got to do is to suppress a rebellion by officers who've just come back from the Napoleonic Wars and have been exposed to the way things are in the West and are now looking for reforms. And, you know, they're after a constitution and all this sort of thing. Um, and it becomes f very difficult for Nicholas because he doesn't want to suppress the rebellion by force of arms initially because obviously he doesn't want to spill blood on the first day of his reign but in the end that's what ends up happening so the troops open fire he and those who aren't killed are exiled to Siberia along with their wives and families uh, added further Caucasian lands to the empire so in his time you're talking about what's now Georgia and Azerbaijan becoming part of the empire began the forced Russification of Poland so trying to stamp out po uh, thoughts of Polish independence. Built Russia's first railway line, again more or less contemporary with the first ones in Britain. Died at the height of the Crimean War, and his death was actually the catalyst for the end of the Crimean War. Because the first thing his son had, sorry, the first thing his son had to do on coming to the throne was to sign a humiliating peace treaty to end the Crimean War. Okay, so Alexander the Liberator ended the Crimean War, as I've just said, on coming to the throne in 1855-56. Freed the surviving members of the Decembrist Rebellion and started to rehabilitate them. 1861, he brings serfdom to an end, officially abolishes it. Established elected local councils, so again, more enlightened reforms, and grants limited self-government to the major towns. Reformed the judiciary, the state finance and education. Abolishes the Polish autonomy following the Polish uprising of 1862. Expands Russian territory to the Sea of Japan, so across to Vladivostok. But he's, he's the one who sells Alaska to the USA, Seward's Folly and all that thing, and cedes the Kuril Islands to Japan. And he completes the conquest of Transcaucasia. So again, you know, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, etc. And also the Central Asian Khanates, which is basically the Stans these days. So Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, etc. But um, so 
Alexander II's reign effectively falls into two halves because the first half is all about you know reform and you know modernizing things but then there's a complete about turn around 1870 which some historians attribute to the fact that his beloved son and heir died around then and uh, as a result of some deep personal trauma he Alexander becomes reactionary and you know he turns against reform and becomes more of an autocrat um, and f as you imagine this alienates a lot of elements in Russian society both the lower orders and the nobility who, are, who want reform and by the time he switches back on to reform it's already too late I mean he returns to the reform agenda in about 1879-1880 uh, but in 1881 he's assassinated by the group known as the People's Will of which a key member was Alexander Ulyanov. Now, if that name means nothing to you, his younger brother Vladimir will mean something because he is the man who becomes known as Lenin. So, that is one of the main things that turns Lenin against the state is the fact that his brother is part of this conspiracy which assassinates Alexander II and he loses his life because of it. So Alexander Peacemaker, the most ironically named or sobriquet ruler I've ever come across. He, this guy was ultra reactionary. So ends all hopes of political reform and effectively creates a police state. <coughs> yeah, peacemaker, okay, and the Pope's a Buddhist. Um, in institutes official anti-Semitism, <coughs> so creates the Pale of Settlement on the western boundary of the empire and says to all the Jews, right, you've got to live there from now on. oversaw Russia's first child labor laws, import tariffs, and began work on the Trans-Siberian Railway, as well as relief organizations, I suppose what we'd call charities. Although politically, as I said, he was ultra-reactionary, a bit like this nutcase that's just won a fourth term in Hungary, I think. And... His failed diplomacy sees Russia become effectively isolated from the rest of the world diplomatically. Why is that coming in again? I must have put two effects on there. Right, and we're down to the end of the story. Nicholas the Passion Bearer. Now, to explain what a passion bearer is, um, it's basically a degree of sainthood within the Orthodox Church that at one time or other was also used in the Catholic Church and it's the next step down from being a martyr. So whereas a martyr dies explicitly for their religious beliefs, a passion bearer doesn't necessarily. So. Considered a weak leader, dominated by his mother, that mother being um, Maria Fyodorovna, born Dagmar of Denmark, the sister of our own Queen Alexandra. Went to war with Japan over Korea and Manchuria, um, leading to the, the disaster of Port Arthur in 1905, where the Imperial fleet was 
given a good old beating by Japan. And an um, interesting historical footnote there being that um, President Theodore Roosevelt was involved in the peace negotiations and his big stick clearly worked because he was, after that, the first American to get the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, allied Russia with France and Great Britain in World War I. So this is the Entente Cordiale. <coughs> Saw off 1905 revolution, the original Bloody Sunday, but forced to abdicate in 1917, as we know. And we all know what the consequences of that were. So there's a nice family photo for you. Pre, um, I would guess that was taken probably about 1909-10. Uh, you've got the little Zarevich Alexei in the foreground with the parents in the second row, Alex of Hesse and Nicholas II. Now, if I, if I can remember the age order, you've got, I think it's Tatiana on the left. Then Anastasia is obviously the youngest. What were the other two names? I think one of them's Natalia on the left. And I forgot, I've forgotten the other one's name. But yeah, the, there's what might have been a very early color photo of a family that by all... Or Olga, yes. Or Olga would be the one with red hair in the middle. <coughs> the one next to Alexei, the youngest one. Ben, can I ask you if there's a remarkable resemblance of the Tsar there to our royal family? Yes. The George V yeah. and my first cousins. cousins. Oh, oh, they were first, oh, right. Descended from Queen Victoria. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were first cousins. And, uh, and of course, Alex of Hesse was Queen Victoria's granddaughter as well. So. Well, yes, I mean, it, it was this convention that royals only married other royals. Yeah. That was before uh, inbreeding became a criminal offence, obviously. Okay. So. And this is where it all came to an end. The Apathy of House in Yekaterinburg. So you can see now that this is not only a tale of two teenagers, but it's also a tale of two Apathyevs. Because you had the Apathyev Monastery earlier on, where we found Mikhail in 1613. And we've got the Apathyev House in Yekaterinburg, where the assassination took place in 1918. So bookend in the dynasty, as it were. And, I th and we'll just finish on this. This is just to give you an idea of where Yekaterinburg lies on the map. So, I mean, Yekaterinburg is pretty much on the border between Europe and Asia. And you're a good day or so out of Moscow on the Trans-Siberian. So, Moscow over here in the west, Yekaterinburg in the center, in the middle of the Ural Mountains. This is what's now the border with Kazakhstan. Um, Voronezh down there, a place close to my heart, because that's where I did my Euro abroad placement. Um, where, where else is interesting on there? Aryol, where Turgenev, the writer, came from. Kursk, f famous battle in World War II, of course, and a, and a famous submarine. And I think that is it. Any questions? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, are there any questions for Ben? Yeah. 
How many of the direct descendants of that family are still alive? Uh, di direct descendants from, from the imperial family. Uh, I believe there aren't any. There are more distant relatives still alive, you know, descending from Nicholas's brothers or from his uncles and aunts, but none of the children lived long enough to have any children of their own. Any more questions? No, not a chance. Well, apart, quite apart from the fact that they've actually found the remains. Ah, um, so they've DNA'd them yes. some way. Yeah. They did a, oh. She was asking, uh, does I it believe, the Anastasia myth. Uh, you know, that Anastasia actually survived the assassination. And, I mean, they did find the remains a few years ago now. And they actually did a DNA test with Prince Philip to prove that they were the remains and then buried them in the um, imperial crypt. Well, he's descended from the... Yeah, 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 there's... Well, the Danish side, yes, because he's descended from the Danish royal family, which the Tsar's mother was also descended from, and also... Well, yeah, yeah, the Danish royal family, uh, so, sorry, the Greek royal family s started out as Danish. More and more complicated. <laughs> yeah, of course. They had to advertise for a king and they got themselves a Dane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Again, I would, I would think it was something to do with the close relationship between um, certainly our Queen Alexandra and the Tsar's mother, Maria Fyodorovna. Um, I, I mean, they were known to be extremely close. And, I mean, they spent, when Nicholas was growing up, they did actually spend a lot of time on holiday in Denmark together, the branches of the family. And, as I say. Ben, when they applied to come to England to be saved, was there a political reason that our king didn't back them? Well, just, just to get off the video and the audience. Sorry? So you just remove the sound from the video and the audience. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Trouble with the technology as it were. Um, so, so the question was... Um, Sorry, what was the question? Was there, was there a particular um, political reason why his cousin didn't save him? Because he did apply to come to Britain and we stood back. Yeah. Even though he was actually an ally. Yeah, well, it, it was intended that he would come. The king initially decided that he would come. But... Um, it was thought that, um, obviously, the, there was a thought that the whole concept of monarchy was becoming generally unpopular. Because don't forget, this was around the time as well that they changed the surname. So it was, the concept of monarchy itself was becoming unpopular. And there was a fear that it would lead to political unrest yeah. here if the imperial family came. So they withdrew the offer, and we all know what happened after that. Are there any more questions? What do you think about that? What, what do you think about that decision? 
Because you studied so much about Russia, you have a view, I expect. Um, question is, what did Ben think of that, the fact that the British withdrew the invitation? Well, um, it, it's always difficult to... to yeah, and the thing is, to judge these things from um, several years later, f from a 21st century perspective... I don't think you can make a particularly good judgment either way. Um, I mean, it's like all these controversies that have come up recently with, you know, statues of people like Cecil Rhodes and Colston and so on. And you, you have to judge historical events in their context. You cannot divorce what went on from the context. So... I mean, any value judgment we make a hundred years later actually has no value. Yeah, exactly. Are there any more questions? I did enjoy that. I think that whole thing was brilliant. Well, um, only remains for me to um, thank Ben very much for this. I must admit that my. Um, I'm ashamed to say that my lack of knowledge of Russian history is encyclopedic. Um, so I found this absolutely fascinating, Ben. It uh, really filled in quite a few blanks, I think, and put over really, really well. Um, so, can we I know, I know. And as has been noted, without a single note. I don't know how he does it. Um, please, can we show Ben our appreciation of the usual? <laughs>